Um, one announcement is for um, Tuesday, right? Christmas Eve, 3 o'clock, 3 to 4-ish. It won't be very long. I think my sermon's only maybe 20 minutes. My sermon today is only probably 30, so not too bad. Won't keep you too long. Um, so it, bring a friend. I, I'm, I, if somebody needs to hear the gospel on Christmas Eve, what a great Christmas gift to give them, right? They will hear the gospel, at least from Apex, okay? We will talk about, we will talk about Jesus and the gospel and, and why, you know, why things are the way they are. But, um, yeah. So I'm going to read a quote to you, and then um, I'm going to read the same quote at the end of the sermon after we're done. So we'll see how it goes. And the quote is this. It's unknown. It's unknown. It says, What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. I just like that quote, so... Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Famous verse, right? And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him in the end. So I can remember, I remember when Kayla was little, right? And and I'm I'm, I'm not going to say the age because she's not here. It wouldn't embarrass her, right? So this is what happened. Kayla came up to me and says, I want to write a letter to Jesus. I said, okay. Letter to Jesus. That's great. Let's do this. And she goes, okay. She goes, dear Jesus, I have been good for six months. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Six months? Really? And she's, she's like, okay, okay, okay. Dear Jesus, I, 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 have been, I have been really, really good for three months. And I said, seriously? You're going to go with three months? And she said, she said, okay, okay. Dear Jesus, I've been good for two weeks. And then she goes, ah, scratched it out. And she goes, dear Jesus, I've been good for two hours. And, she, and then she thought for a second, and she scratched that out. And then she walked over, and we had this little nativity scene over there. And she walked over, and she grabbed Mary off the nativity scene and came back. And, and she said, dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again, you'll... <laughs> Nobody? Really? Is that an old one? Is that what it is? I liked it. I mean, it never happened, though. It's complete, complete. I was going to use, you know, John, but I just didn't think it would work with John. So, I mean, Kaylee's not here. That way I don't get in trouble. You know, the holidays, they're real joyous, right? I mean, it's a joyous time of the year. It's, it, you know, filled with twinkling lights. Everybody, who, how many have people have lights up? Right? You got lights? I don't have lights up. Festive decorations. Anybody have the giant Santa Claus? You know, I seen one the other day. It was facing in somebody's house, looking in there. I, I thought the wind had to blow that one, it, you know. Um, and then lots of cookies. I see somebody invented German chocolate cake cookies. Love them. Thank you. Love that. But, you know, but not everything in, De in December really inspires good tidings, right? Um, I mean, the day after Thanksgiving, right? Did you see this on the news? A guy had a heart attack right on Black Friday, dropped right there in the crowd, and they stepped over him. Right? Come on. You know, in, you know, in, in, you know, right now Christmas starts after Thanksgiving for most of us, but for some of us it starts after Halloween. I've seen the sales going on then. And, I mean, radio stations start playing the music around the clock. Chris and I have been jamming to the tunes, you know, around the clock. And I love, I love, anybody love Christmas music? Anyone? Just a few of us? I love Christmas music, so. I mean, you're going to hear, you know, jingles anytime you're out, right? When you, you know that, that research has said that when you go into a store, if they play Christmas music, you're more likely to buy something Christmas. Did you know that? So they play that Christmas music. So, you know, S Silent Night, that's my favorite, I think, um, Jingle Bells, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, right? Anybody? Those are good songs, but, you know, all these holiday classics are love. But there's certain songs, right, that just want to make you punch that snowman right in the nose. Did you know that? And, and, and because, because they're overplayed or obnoxious or just downright offensive, some of them are just really bad. And, and so here's what I did. I put together, and I did this on the Internet. I didn't. These are not my opinion. This is the worst songs. Top five. Here we go. Top five. Number five. 
Santa Baby by Eartha Kitt. Agree? I, I, that's a just really bad song. Number four, there was a tie. And it, it was a tie between I want a hippopotamus for Christmas and I want, all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. Right? Now, I like all I want for Christmas my two front teeth, probably because I had to sing it when I was in, you know, elementary school or whatever. But, all right, number, number three, Last Christmas by Wham. Oh, yeah. That's just really bad. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, and then number two, and I never heard of this one before. Maybe you guys have. It says, uh, Please, Daddy, Don't Get Drunk This Christmas by John Denver. Anybody ever? I mean, come on. I've never heard of that one before. Never even heard of that. You guys? Just Taven. He's the only one. Now, this will, this will, what do you, any, any guesses? If you can guess this, we're going to have a $10 gift card. You got five seconds to guess it. What's the worst song ever? What, four? No, three? No, two. All right, now this one surprised me. The worst song ever was by a Christian group. It was by New Song, and it was called The Christmas Shoes. Remember the red shoes for the mom, and the guy gave them to him? That, that was by far, I looked on three sites, and it was two of the three sites. It was, it was the worst song. So those, you know, real, really what that tells us is, you know, you, there's good and bad at Christmas. And, and just like that video, which I thought was pretty cool. I mean, I thought that was really kind of a spot-on video. And at the end, they asked, you know, who, who, would, who would have Jesus in? Who would have Mary in? And I think at that time, probably nobody. But see, you notice that verse 7 says, she gave birth to her first son. So Mary gave birth to Jesus. Now think about this. She was probably somewhere between 13 and 15 years old, just a kid, a kid. And Joseph was probably about the same age. And so, you know, she, she gave birth to Jesus by herself. And then um, she wrapped him in cloths, right, by herself, Right? So Joseph was there to help. But let's be honest, you know, a, a young 15-year-old kid and a woman giving birth, there ain't going to be much there, right? It's not going to happen. I mean, and then, you know, Luke tells us that she laid him in a manger, which was really, like they said on there, it was just an animal feeding trough. That's all it was. So Joseph probably got the straw. That's probably his part, right? And there was claws, and she kept him warm. And, and you know, there was no room for them. And, and, and the innkeeper turned him away. And... and, and what did the innkeeper miss about the whole thing? What did he miss? I mean, think about it. What, did, what do you think he missed? And I think the answer is just that he was preoccupied, right? I mean, there's a lot of things going on in, in, in Bethlehem. There's people coming in for the senses, and his inn was full, and he was preoccupied. And he sent a pregnant woman to a stable, to a barn. Some people say it was a cave. It could have been a cave, but I think it was probably a stable. Or it could have been out in the middle of nowhere. So, I mean, he was preoccupied. And, and he was busy. And, and how many of us get like that, like the innkeeper? Right? I mean, we fill our lives with all these needless things sometimes. I mean, I mean um, the, with stuff that doesn't matter. We fill our lives with, you know, with... with with things that are really God's stuff that he gave us. And, you know, as a result, we miss the God or the Christ of God born in a manger. You know, our world's filled with these unnecessary, insignificant, and meaningless things. Like Ecclesiastes said, right? Vanity, vanity, vanity. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. And we spend a fortune to collect God's stuff so we can let our children fight over them when we pass away. We learned about that last week, right? I mean, they're going to fight over it. It's going to end up in a landfill or a yard sale. Our time's eaten away with the demands of our stuff, and, you know, the place takes it where we go, and we don't spend time with family. We don't actually get into that, and we miss the Christ at Christmas time because he's crowded out by a world that dictates what we do, should think and do and buy, and like the innkeep, innkeeper, people today or us, we are preoccupied. And the, in, the innkeeper didn't know anything, you know, about Mary's baby, right? We've got to give him that. He didn't know that. And, and he, maybe he didn't even know she was pregnant because maybe Joseph went in and asked. I'm sure he would have used that pregnant thing, though, after he said, I don't have room. My wife's pregnant. Look at her. She's getting ready to bust. But it didn't work. 
Instead, they ignored the, you know, he was preoccupied with his routine and the meaningless. And, you know, and, and how sad is it that so many of us live our lives in pursuit of stuff, chasing things, and, we, and then sometimes we become our own God because of that, and only to wake up in eternity without God. And some of us celebrate Christmas all of our lives and don't understand why Jesus came, and that's what I want to talk about. I mean, who is this child in the manger? And, you know, I, I'm just going to spoil it for you right now. He's God, right? I'm just going to throw that out there. But, you know, maybe, you know, with the faith he's given us from the Holy Spirit, because the Bible clearly says that the Holy Spirit is the one who saves, right? It, it, we can see that clearly now that he is God. But, but why would God become a man and, and be born in such a lowly manner, right? He is king. He was God. He was born in a lowly manner. And let men treat him the way that he did. And why would Jesus, you know, why, you know, it says in, in, in Colossians that he existed before all things and, and holding, you know, first place in everything. And, and, and he agreed to come to earth as a baby and suffer the abuse that he suffered. He volunteered to do that. And he died in such a painful, excruciating way. And in the, in the Apostle Paul, he's clear because he says, it was the, the Father's good pleasure through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. He made, God made peace with man through the blood of his cross. So Jesus dies to make peace between God and man. And God is justifiably angry at our sins, right? He's, it's justifiable. There's no taking that away. We all sin. All have sinned. And we do so repeatedly, right? But yet, he loves us enough, sinners, enough that he gave his own son to live on earth, to die on a cross, and, and to, to bear sin in his own body and suffer the full weight of God's wrath. Jesus drank the cup, right? He drank the cup for us. Because you can't do that, and neither can I. So Christmas is mainly a celebration of God's love towards mankind. But make no mistake, make no mistake at all, the babe in the manger is more than just a child. He's more than just a child. He's the express image of God. And, and he took on human flesh and he, so he could bear in that the body of sins of the world. He bore your sins. And he made it possible, the, the gift of God, right? He, gave, he made it possible for eternal life. And that's what the message of Christmas really is. And how many of us are going to share that this week? How many of you will share that this week? Don't get lost in, in this wide world view of life. Don't do that. Not now, not at Christmas, because this is your time. This is your time to shine again. The incarnation of God in Jesus Christ is, is nothing but personal to us. It's personal. This is the message of Christmas for you. He who entered this world and took human flesh, he took upon flesh and died on the cross to bear sin for the penalty of our iniquities. And it removes your guilt. And some of us can't let go of that. Let go of your guilt. He, he forgave it. See, that forgiveness from guilt and sin Jesus offers to you. Because Jesus came to forgive sinners and bring them into his presence by virtue of his own sacrificial death. So the question, do you desire his forgiveness? And do you long for God's embrace? Do you long for it? Have you ever thought about the first thing that's going to I saw this meme on, on the internet where this woman, just, she's just got her, she, she died and she's just got her arms around Jesus. I mean, specifically, God calls you to respond in the faith that he gives you. I mean, turn from your sin to follow him. Believe that he has forgiven your sin and trust him with your life. Follow him without any reservation at all. Past, present, and future. No reservation. Jesus Christ, he, he has to take his rightful place as Lord, Lord. First place in everything. 
Submit to him. And, and he who created everything will make you a new creation, a new creature, uh, remolded in his image. And we'll talk about that in a minute. New desires and a new heart. And that comes from 2 Corinthians 5.17. You know, should you respond to God's offer of forgiveness in Christ, that, you know, this Christmas could be truly, truly a time to celebrate. For you have the greatest gift you can ever give. The greatest gift. I mean, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. That comes from Romans 3.24. See, all of this, all of Christmas, was perfectly timed. And I'm going to show you where. Galatians 4, Galatians 4 verse 5. I'm going to take a drink real quick. It says this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And I'm not going to talk about adoption as sons and daughters, but, but what is the fullness of time? It's God's sovereign time. It's, he entered world events, and he changed things around. He, he, he providentially moved things to where he wanted them because he knew all things, and, and all these things happened in perfect time, and, and, that, and that's when Christ was born. And for many Christians, it's time to think of Jesus Christ as a, being a baby in a manger, you know, that little six-pound baby Jesus, remember? And, and, and while the birth of Christ is special and a miraculous event, take nothing away from it. It shouldn't be your primary focus should not be your primary focus. The, the central truth of the, of the Christmas story is this, that the child of God, or the child of Christmas is God. We get that. And, and, and Christmas is about, not about the, uh, the Savior's six-pound baby Jesus. It's about his deity. It's about God. It's about the birth of Christ that is, is intended to conceal the reality that, that God himself was born into the world and laid in that animal trough, and smelled the smells, that the dung that was in there, like I said last week, and, and all the, the sights and sounds that were in there. Fully God as a baby, fully man too, right? But the modern world, the version of Christmas, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't do that, right? I mean, the greater part of the world, Christmas has no legitimate meaning. It's about gifts and chocolate cake, German chocolate cake, food, maybe, maybe even partying, I, partying, I don't know. And I, and I don't suppose anyone can ever think of what it means for God to be born in a manger. And how do you explain Jesus humbling himself to that teeny, and putting himself in that teeny tiny infant body, and our minds can't, can't begin to understand uh, that, that he was involved in, in God becoming a man? I mean, can anybody explain how, how God would become a baby? Yet he did. He did do that for you, and, and without discard his God, you know, without discarding all the godly nature and character that he had, he, or diminishing his deity, he was still God, and he was born. He still, at that time, had the earth in his hand. He had you in his hand two thousand years ago, and he was born into the world as a tiny baby in a barn and laid in a feed trough, and, and he was fully human with all the needs and emotions that we have, and, and they're all common to us. Yet he was God, and yet he, he experienced experienced all of that for us so he could tell us that he had, had experienced it all. And yet he was fully God, all wise and all powerful. And for nearly 2,000 years, 2,000 years, the debate has raged on about who Jesus really is. You know, all these cults and skeptics and atheist people, they, they, you know, they have all these different opinions and explanations, and they say that he is just you know, one of the many gods, little g, or he's created being, or he's an angel, or he's a good teacher, or he's a prophet, and so on. And, and the common thread of those theories is this, that Jesus is less than God. But the biblical evidence that the child that was laying in that manger was the incarnation of God. And the scripture captures the heart of Jesus and it kind of underscores the truth that make, make Christmas truly a wonderful time of the year. And listen to what Colossians says in, in chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and verse 15, it says this. He is the image of the invisible God, 
the first of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was dwelt was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to him all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So I wanted to pre-do that and bring it back. So scripture records for us that, you know, here, this was probably the farewell message of Jesus when he, when he rose. I, that, and this is what, what a lot of the scholars think, and I want to read this for you. It's in Hebrews. And it says this, and it's not till the end, but in Hebrews chapter 10, it says this in verse 5, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. And then listen, this is what he said. And then behold, and he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And what he's saying is that passage of Scripture gives us a remarkable look at the heart of Jesus when he was right before his birth. And it says he knew he was entering into the world to be the sacrifice for our sins, yet he came. His body had been prepared by God specifically for that purpose, yet he came. And, 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 and Jesus was going to die for the sins of the world, and he knew it. Moreover, he did it freely. Whatever your will is, God. Knowing that God's will had already been done. And, and, and that was the whole point of the incarnation. The, 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 the important issue of Christmas is not so much that Jesus came, but why he came. There is no salvation in his birth, right? You get that. No salvation at all. No salvation in the sinless life he lived. Not at all. No salvation in, in, in being beaten or mocked. Redemption was not gained from his life on earth. As flawless as Jesus was, and very important that it was, his life could not rescue us from being dead in our sins. Even his teaching, the greatest ever told us, or ever revealed to us, he, he could not save us from sins. There was a price that had to be paid. God demanded a price. Someone had to die. And if you read the Revelations, it said they looked around heaven, and the only one they could find to open the scroll was Jesus. He knew that. Only Jesus could do that for us. Jesus came to earth to reveal God to us. He came to teach us the truth. He came to fulfill the law. He came to offer his kingdom. He came to, to show us how to live. He came to reveal God's love. He came to, he came to, to bring peace. He, he, he came to heal the sick. He came to minister to the needy. Are you one of those? He came, but all those reasons are incidental. They're incidental because it's not his ultimate purpose. He, he, he could have done all that without coming down, right? He could have healed any one of those people before, without coming down. I mean, he, he didn't have to be born as a human. He could have just simply appeared like one of the angels and said, okay, you're healed. Okay, this is that. This is this. This is that. Or anything. He just spoke it from heaven. He could have done that. But he had one more reason to come. Just one. This, he came to die. He knew he was going to die. And he came to die. See, here's a side of Christmas story that isn't often told, right? Those soft little hands, that embryo that the Holy Spirit stuck in there, those nails drove through those soft little hands. Those baby feet, so cute, little Nike shoes maybe, Right? Little baby shoes, little baby feet, pink, not able to walk, not strong enough to walk. They came so they could put a nail through that. One day he, he would stagger up a dusty hill to be nailed to a cross. And that, you know, that sweet little infant head 
with the sparkling eyes and a cute little smile was formed up someday that somebody would just ram a crown of thorns on his head. That tender body, soft and warm and wrapped in swaddling clothes, wrapped in, wrapped in cloths, however you want to say it, want old, you know, King James on you, one day would be ripped open by a spear. Jesus was born to die. And I'm not trying to drag down your Christmas spirit here, because you should celebrate that. He was born to die. Far from it. Jesus' death, though devised and carried out by evil men, and those men someday are going to look at him, and, and what do you, I mean, you ever thought about that? I was the one that killed you. I was the one that beat you. Jesus' death, right? In fact, it represents the greatest victory over evil anyone has ever accomplished. I mean, the, the author of Hebrews illustrates how the story of his, of, his, of his birth includes a sacrificial death, right? So if you look at Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 9 and 10, it says this, But we see him for a little while, was made lower than the angels, Namely, Jesus. So he's even telling you who it is. Crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for, what's the next word? Everyone. For it's fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist, and bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of our salvation Perfect through suffering, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, and that's us. He himself likewise partook of the same things. He's done everything that you can think of that you could do, and through that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. He says it right there, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. In some other verses it says that you are dead in your trespasses and sins until the Holy Spirit gives you the faith to believe. So you have to celebrate the birth of Christ. But don't make the mistake of leaving him in that manger. Not, he's not that six-pound baby Jesus there, sweet and innocent. Keep in mind that his birth was just the first step of God's glorious plan to redeem his chosen children. Remember that in the triumph of Christ's Sacrificial death. That means that it's, it, it gives a humble birth, right? It was just a humble birth. You can't tru truly celebrate the birth without the death. And then you look at Luke 2 and verse, verse 11, and it says this. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. He didn't just say Israel, he said all the people. For unto you to, is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And praise Jesus that God became man. Not only did they call him Christ, they called him Lord. Emmanuel, infinitely rich. He became poor. He assumed our nature. He, he entered into a, a, a world that was polluted with sin. And, and, and he took our guilt, although he was sinless. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. And he was bruised for our iniquity. That's Isaiah 53, right? 53, 53 5. And all that, all of that, Wrapped up in Emmanuel, God with us. I mean, the Apostle Paul penned probably the happiest truth in Scripture in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, he said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that though he was rich, yet for your sake and my sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty, might become rich. 
You should read that verse and memorize that verse. That's the immeasurable gift of Christmas. Christ, God's own son, gave up his wealth, his crown, his throne, his privilege to live as God with us, that he might save his people from their sins and, and through his poverty that you can be rich because you get him. For today in the city of David, there was born for you a Savior who was Christ the Lord. And Christ is the glorious title for a baby born in a humble stable. I mean, Jesus came. He didn't wear a crown. He, he had no halo, right, to identify who he was. I mean, he didn't have any tattoos on his arms saying, hey, I'm the king of kings, but he will. Got one on his thigh coming, right? No, nothing marked his deity. Nothing said, hey, I'm the sovereign. I, I hold, I'm holding you in my hand while you beat me. All the time while you're, while you're doing what you're doing, I'm allowing you to breathe my air. I'm making your lungs move. I'm making your mouth move to inhale. Nothing said that he was the Savior, except for the angels, right? But when the angel announced Jesus' birth to the shepherds, the angels proclaimed to the world that one born that night was Christ the Lord. So don't get lost. Don't get lost in Christmas that this world produces. At least not, not the 24th and 25th. Jesus is the, the reason for the season. We say that all the time. But his message of Christmas for you is, I came into this world and I took on flesh and I died on a cross for your sin. And I rose again and I paid the price for all your iniquities to remove the guilt. And that pardon from guilt that he offered you, he came to forgive sinners and to, to bring you back into his presence of his death. My question for you is simply this, and I said this earlier, do you desire his forgiveness and do you long for his embrace? You have to respond to that. Specifically, right, God calls you to respond by the faith he gives. John 3.18 says this, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And then in John 3.36, he says this, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So you have to follow him without reservation. Jesus Christ has to take his rightful place as Lord in your life, first in everything. And like Colossians 1.8 said, he is the beginning. And then later on it says, 1.18, he says he is the beginning. And then it says that in everything, he might be preeminent. He might be first. Submit to him. And, and he who created everything will make you a new cre creation. He'll make you a new cre creature molded in his image with new desires and a new heart. And I'll end with this. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. That's God's offer of forgiveness. And that would make Christmas truly a time to celebrate. If you, if you have the greatest gift you can ever receive, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption of that is Christ Jesus. So I started this with a quote. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tenderly is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, 